Good evening, afternoon, night, morning, whenever you find a way to watch or listen to this podcast. It's me, Omar, from Hardware again. And just a reminder that we have rebranded. The YouTube channel is Hardware. It encompasses all of our podcasts and mini documentaries. So uh, just uh, wanted to connect all of our social media platforms on TikTok and Instagram to uh, the new YouTube channel. But I'm back with a new guest, uh, a very a guest I'm excited to have on, just with his wealth of knowledge on, on a topic and a conference that really doesn't get talked about much. But um, it's kind of... I wouldn't say in the limelight, but um, there there's some news with this conference that's kind of um, that's kind of like generated some buzz. Uh, I'm joined by Ralph um, Ventry. I should ask before the podcast. So did I pronounce it right, Ventry or Ventry? You got it, Ventry. Of course, Ralph okay. Ventry. Um, formerly of the Northeast Conference, I spent 15 years as the public relations director for NEC football. Um, when uh, I left the NEC. I had the title of assistant commissioner. Um, Since then, I've gone on to cover the football championship subdivision for NFL Draft Bible on SI.com. I also started my own football website as a hobby, and um, I just launched my own communications firm, uh, Circle the Wagons, LLC, Circle the wagons dot biz, social media optimization, traditional PR, marketing. We do it all. Um, a focus, of course, on sports, but we'll help you promote any product, any business that you have. So uh, check us out at circle the wagons dot biz. But I'm sure you want to talk FCS football today, as, as you mentioned. And um, it seems as if realignment which uh kind of went wild back in 2010 2012 around there it looks like realignment is back uh it seems to be alive and well and of course there are always rumors that there has to be something on the d1 ticker for folks to talk about so um there are always going to be rumors and speculation out there and uh yeah, let's chop it up, Omar. Yeah, I'm excited. And Ralph, I'll have the links to those sites in the uh, in the bo- <clears throat> excuse me in the description, then in the description of the video and uh, and audio podcast on Spotify. Uh, but yeah, so um, if you if you're watching this or listening and haven't heard, Saint Francis of Brooklyn uh, shut down all of its athletic programs, not just basketball, not just women's basketball, but every single one of their programs. So it's just pretty much a college now. Uh, in Brooklyn with no athletics, and they were a member of the Northeast Conference. Excuse me, I don't know why I'm so congested, but um, they were a member of the Northeast Conference. So that leaves the Northeast Conference with eight members, um, eight full-time members, eight football-playing members. So now the only non-football-playing member is Fairleigh Dickinson, of course. A lot of people know about Fairleigh Dickinson now. And then uh, the only uh, only football-only member is Duquesne. So the conference is kind of in a in a uh, in- unstable position uh, and to be quite honest with you, it's really the least attractive conference in the region. Uh, I'm not I'm not trying to disrespect uh, the conference that, that employed you, Ralph, but uh, just in terms of looking at seeding for like the the, NC, the NCAA tournament, um, they're constant 16 seeds uh, compared to America East, where you'll get a team like Vermont sometimes get a 13 seed and an easier matchup than, of course, a one seed in the first round of the tournament, men's and women's side. So um, I guess... My question is, is um, how, uh, I guess, where, where does the NEC go from here? I know for, I know I wrote um, a piece, which I'll include in the, in the description about Chicago state potentially being a candidate because Chicago stays independent. But uh, I just want to know your thoughts on where the Northeast conference goes from here. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Chicago state and I'll talk about the viability of Chicago state in a league like the NEC. Um, in a minute, but I wanted to touch on St. Francis, Brooklyn. Obviously, that was some really sad news. Um, It was inevitable, but I don't think the folks there expected it to happen this quickly. Uh, A couple of years ago, St. Francis College announced that they were selling their building, essentially their campus. Um, And they were moving operations into a couple different floors 
in a, in a different building in a different part of Brooklyn. Uh, for those not familiar with St. Francis College, tiny liberal arts school run by the Franciscans, and its campus was on a city block in Brooklyn across from Burrow Hall, and it was about five or six interconnected buildings. And in the main building, they had the gym uh, on the first floor where they played varsity basketball. They had an auxiliary gym uh, upstairs where they would play volleyball. There was a pool in the basement where they would swim and play water polo. So, you know, not only was this the college campus for classes, all of the athletic facilities and amenities were in this building. And two years ago, St. Francis announced the plan to sell this building. I assume it's because the Lee, uh, the uh, college was in financial trouble. Uh, I know it got hit hard by COVID. Uh, I'm sure that really decimated enrollment. And this building, um, you know, Brooklyn is a hip, a hip borough now. You know, it's up and coming, and 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 the real estate is through the roof. So this building was, or these five interconnected buildings, I should say, um, this was the most valuable asset the college had. And obviously they felt desperation and they decided to sell the building and they never had a plan in place for athletics. So this past year, um, they played the last basketball game in the old building in November. And then for the rest of the year, they were competing at uh, Pratt, which is um, a, an art school in Queens, uh, in a different borough. And they had to take buses to practice. Um, so they they did this. And, and miraculously, the uh, they started, the men's and women's basketball teams both performed fairly well in conference play, um, despite all of these distractions and constraints. Uh, and it just goes to speak that Glenn Breka and Linda Simino, uh, the men's and women's basketball coaches at St. Francis, uh, tremendous people, tremendous coaches, and uh, they were fighting through all of this. And I think everyone realized that it was not sustainable, but I don't think they envisioned the school administration pulling the plug this quickly. I think they were hoping that this would go on for maybe two or three years. And in that time, they would be able to find a space to play basketball again and call their own. But the difficulty of that in New York city, it, it's really not practical. Um, you don't just build a gym in New York City. You don't just buy cheap property uh, in New York City. So unfortunately, I think this whole St. Francis College, I, I, I don't want to be the I told you so, but um, unfortunately, the writing was on the wall. But uh, no one expected it to happen this quickly. And it's definitely sad. Um, and it definitely is a huge blow to the NEC, which already absorbed two body blows last year. Um, you mentioned that there's only one non-football playing member in the league now, Fairley Dickinson. And, and congrats to Fairley Dickinson for uh, knocking off Purdue. Uh, you know, only the second ever 16 over a one. But you mentioned that they're the only non-football playing school well, obviously, St. Francis College was 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 another, and they're closing up shop. And Mount St. Mary's was another. And Mount St. Mary's left last year for the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference. Then Bryant left for the America East Conference, and they have found a temporary home for their football program in the Big South, which... Rhode Island in the Big South, hey, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so 
the NEC membership has taken a hit because uh, Bryant and Mount St. Mary's were really more key members. Um, and two years prior to that, they lost Robert Morris University out of Pittsburgh. And Robert Morris went to the Horizon League and then found its football, uh, got its football into the Big South. So the NEC membership has been shrinking. Uh, they added a Division II team last year, Stonehill, which has a football program. Um, but at the end of the day, they only have eight core members. They only have seven core members who play football. They're in dangerous territory. I'm sure they're looking at other options, um, but I don't know exactly what will come to fruition. Now, if we want to keep going here and get into Chicago State, you say, hey, Chicago State, the NEC, do they need membership? Chicago State needs a place to go. You know, I think it's interesting that you bring up Chicago State because back in the 1990s, there was a league called the Mid-Continent Conference, the Mid-Con. And Chicago State was a member of the Mid-Con. Um, the Mid-Con, I believe it was transformed into maybe the Summit League. Uh, I, 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 uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, I, I believe it's it's the remnants of the Mid-Con or the modern-day Summit League. But anyway, um, Central Connecticut State, had come up from Division Two, they didn't have a home in Division One because at that time, you didn't need to have a conference commitment in order to reclassify to D1. Now the NCAA requires that a school must be committed to a conference before the school can reclassify. So CCSU comes up they need a place to go. They find the Midcon Conference, but obviously they realized it, it wasn't a long-term solution. It really wasn't viable. In New Britain, Connecticut, playing all of your league games in Illinois, Indiana, and such, it, it, it really wasn't going to work. And in 1997, Central Connecticut got a lifeline from the Northeast Conference and join join the Northeast Conference as a core member institution. So I'm looking back into the 90s and it didn't work the other way around with a school like Central Connecticut. I can't see it working for Chicago State having not only do they have to come out east for every one of their league games but the NEC members have to go out West to return those league games that adds a plane flight. And a lot of these schools with enrollment lagging, you know, chartering a plane flight for 90,000 is, uh, is not in the budget. It's not feasible. And the other thing is, I don't know if Chicago state, fits the institutional profile that the Northeast Conference has targeted over the past 20 years. Um, all of the members in the NEC, except for CCSU, are small private institutions. So there you go, not to rain on your parade, but I think I kind of just doused cold water all over the Chicago State idea. Um, yeah, I just don't see that as, as a viable option for the NEC or for Chicago State. Now, if the NEC were absolutely desperate, where they were going to fall to five core members and fall under that six-member um, requirement to get an AQ, to get an automatic qualifier to the NCAA, then maybe you bring in Chicago State on a temporary basis, but no, I, I just don't foresee that as, as ha ever happening. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, it, it's a good thought experiment for sure. 
and it is of course in this in this age of realignment it, it is a new a new market but of course chicago state's got a small enrollment enrollment a small i guess national alumni base or even like alumni base within the the new england and northeast region so again it's not it's not very viable i will say though like the job that 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 uh their men's basketball pro men's basketball coach his name's escaped me right now but the job he did this past year was outstanding uh i know they were really competitive in a lot of games against a lot of good teams and uh they would they would compete in the nec i think like i mean the stats show their rpi was better than over half the league so they they would compete in basketball right away and there's always an option for football they are considering adding football for sure so i mean it, it is an intriguing thought experiment yeah if you're chicago state you need to find a home. Um, and I'll give you a quote from the old Central Connecticut athletic director, C.J. Jones. Um, I interviewed him one time for a feature story. Uh, he was a, a, a Central Connecticut basketball player, came all the way up through the ranks and was eventually their athletic director. And he was their AD when they were – in the Midcon conference and then moved into the NEC. And he said, Ralph, had we not joined the Northeast conference, I fear what the future would have held for central Connecticut athletics. He said, because only Notre Dame and BYU can get away or, or can, could survive as an independent in division one basketball or in division one athletics, you cannot survive in division one athletics as an independent, unless of course you're Notre Dame or BYU and you have the big, the long time football tradition. And, and really it's just Notre Dame, the big time football television money that Notre Dame gets from the any uh, from NBC so it, it, you just can't do it. So I, I feel for Chicago State. It's uh, it's an impossible situation they, they're in. Uh, NJIT um, here in Newark, New Jersey, now in the America East. Prior to that, they were in the Atlantic Sun. Prior to that, they were independent. They were searching for a home. Um, it, it, was, it was extremely difficult for them. It was extremely difficult uh, for them to operate as as an independent at the Division One level, um, you know, scheduling of course is is the huge part of it, but it goes beyond that. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, yeah, NGIT was the other program that came to mind uh, with the. I mean, recently in terms of being independent, of course, Chicago State and NJ, NJIT are linked, uh, being former Great West members uh, of that that very random conference. Um, you know, so. which was just for which was a group of desperate schools who formed an affiliation for scheduling purposes only, really. It was it was just for scheduling purposes. And and and, you know, now when I say that conferences tend to have like minded membership or their members, the membership profiles match a lot of times, you know, uh, um, the, the, the Big Ten, um, for example, they have uh, it, what is it? The AAU institutions, you know, right. Maryland, Rutgers, those those research oriented institutions, um, you know, that that have a special status, you know. There, but in the Great West, for example, it was it was North Dakota State and NJIT couldn't be two different in two different parts of the country in two more different areas two more different institutions, but yet they just, they had to do it because they needed to get opponents on the schedule somehow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just sad that Chicago state's in that situation again. I mean, always kind of a misfit. I mean, they're in the whack, you know, for a long time traveling to Seattle and Las Cruces, but we'll see. I mean, I'm kind of glad you, uh, you, I guess not really glad, but I mean, you, you pretty much put that, that idea to rest. I mean, uh, even though it is interesting thought experiment, another question I have uh, with the recent happenings in the Northeast conference is does this lack of stability make, um, I guess, make it more likely for St. Francis to follow Robert Morris into the horizon league. 
Um, of course, like they would be travel partners. And, and honestly, they're on an island alone now. Uh, in the I mean, they've been on an island for a long time. You know, after Robert Morris left his full members, they're on an island in in uh, Western Pennsylvania. The Horizon League is in a much better footprint. They have Cleveland State, Youngstown State. And Robert Morris, all is a very nearby school. So, uh, your thoughts on uh St. Francis, Pennsylvania, um, leaving the league? Well, when Mount St. Mary's left, and when Robert Morris left, th- those were the two defections that really affected St. Francis University out in Pennsylvania, um, because they had no travel partner with Robert Morris anymore. And Mount St. Mary's was also uh, somewhat of a close drive. It was closer for St. Francis to go to Mount St. Mary's than it was for them to go to, say, the New York City schools. Um, So now that kind of has left St. Francis, as you said, out in an island, out on an island. They're the only core member NEC institution that is in Pennsylvania Duquesne uh, is an associate member for football and for bowling. Uh, Duquesne is about 90 miles west of St. Francis University. Um, But for St. Francis U, for every one of their sports and every one of their road games, they're taking long overnight trips uh, for conference play. So they have to be frustrated with that, no doubt. But I don't know where they um, want to go or where they where there would be an opportunity for them to go. Um, I don't know if their facilities are up uh, up to snuff where uh, a league like the Horizon would recruit them. Uh, Robert Morris built a brand new, gorgeous uh, basketball facility. Um, two years before it left the NEC. Um, St. Francis's facility is uh, at least 50 years old. Um, so that's a question. And the other thing is, I think St. Francis U as an institution is closely aligned with the Northeast Conference principles Uh, They are a founding member of the NEC. And I just don't know, because if they, if they go, if they were to go to the Horizon League, let's say, what would they do with football? I don't see the school making the financial commitment to send their team to the Big South. Um, But with that said, the football program is still extremely important to the university as a mail enrollment tool. And the, the football has a role uh, without question. So I don't see them ever eliminating football. um, But I also don't see them adding $300,000 to their travel budget to go to the big South. And I know 300,000 doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking about Texas or even North Dakota State, South Dakota State, or even what some of these basketball coaches are making as terms of a salary. But uh, $300,000, $300,000 is a lot for an NEC school. Um, uh, a, A number of these schools... Like I said, they're enrollment driven. Their entire budgets are enrollment driven. And ever since COVID, enrollment has dropped off noticeably at private schools around the country, not just in the NEC. Yeah, I mean, that's a point that I guess a lot of people aren't really looking at in terms of uh, conference alignment, just enrollments too, and the impacts. Uh, I guess that that it has like in terms of football. I mean, I know I know that the NEC had, <clears throat> excuse me, reduced uh, scholarships compared to the rest of the FCS, uh, even if it's by a few. But I mean, 
excuse me that does do a good amount of wonders for um i guess for enrollment as well just like getting the the walk-ons and the pay-for-play players as well uh i i know i know you mentioned i know you asked what saint francis would do um with football if they were to leave uh which i mean in my opinion i think the horizon league is a very is i think a very attractive option if you're saint francis just because for the sake of stability and you already have three other travel partners with you in the Horizon League in uh in Eastern Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, um, and then also too something I brought up as well. It's like little things like um for the men's basketball tournament, for example, if St. Francis were to reach the semifinals of the uh of the Horizon League tournament, all those games are in Detroit. It's in one stationary place. Well, t- well, com- in comparison with the NEC, say they're like a five or six seed. That's two different travel dates um that they're that's two different places they're traveling uh essentially so that, that's another kind of small benefit that that i looked at i know you talked about st francis what they would do with football if they were able to uh get duquesne to make the jump with them to the big south do you see that being more viable uh with uh the big south having brian and then there's two other western pennsylvania schools so that's already three very manageable games to travel to if you're st francis and uh honestly the other northern big south schools well first i i got a shout out we're talking st francis and i got a shout out the head coach there chris valerial um really one of the best people that i met during my time working for the northeast conference um tremendous football coach uh took st francis which St. Francis had never had, had never been 500, never mind a winning record. They had never been 500 at the FCS level in any season at the FCS level. They never had a winning conference record in the NEC prior to Chris Valerio's tenure. Uh, He joined on in 2010 and he's since taken them to the FCS playoffs twice. And obviously most recently this last December or November. Um, So coach V really has done wonders with that program. And he lost uh, who I thought was a future NFL quarterback. He still may be um, Jason Brown. Uh, Jason Brown is going to finish up down at Jackson state in what I think is his sixth or seventh year of college. Uh, But Jason Brown threw for over 3,000 yards as a sophomore with St. Francis. He has a howitzer for an arm. I mean, this kid can put it in the air a good 70 yards. And during COVID, he transferred to South Carolina. He... uh, wound up uh, starting two games for South Carolina late in the season. Uh, He beat Florida, actually, as the South Carolina quarterback. But, um, of course, South Carolina brought in Spencer Rattler. So he left. He went to Virginia Tech. Uh, He was a backup at Virginia Tech this past year. And now he's giving it one more go at Jackson State. Um, But I think had he stayed at St. Francis and had St. Francis not canceled the season due to COVID and had they competed in that spring and had he stayed, he he was on the path to to being uh, a legitimate draft prospect. Um, But with that said, enough about Jason Brown. But what I'm trying to say is that St. Francis was hit harder than any, uh, well, St. Francis Brooklyn was hit hard by COVID, obviously we know, but as far as a football program, St. Francis U in Pennsylvania, they were hit harder by COVID than almost any other program in the country. Only St. Francis and Central Connecticut State were the only two NEC schools who opted out of that COVID affected spring season and coach V lost Jason Brown. He lost so many uh, players to the transfer portal from that team, but yet 
he was able to rebuild it in such a short time. And sure enough, 2022, they're back in the FCS playoffs. So um, limited resources and, you know, it doesn't matter how many times he's gotten knocked down over there. He's gotten that program uh, up to an, uh, a level of respectability that I didn't really know was possible. And, you know, I just had to to shout him out, Coach V, former NFL offensive lineman, actually played eight years with the Bears, three years with my Buffalo Bills. Um, so uh, his last year of playing was 06. And then, like I said, he was kind of just hanging around, coaching, I believe, at a high school in Western PA. Then um, started volunteering at St. Francis. They named him offensive coordinator. And then, sure enough, two years later, he's taken over the program. But anyway, I know we got thrown off on a tangent there. Um, but, yeah, St. Francis has a great coach, and they're doing great things. And I don't see St. Francis or Duquesne moving to the Big South. Not necessarily saying that they'll always be in the NEC, but I don't see them moving to the Big South. In fact, I think the Big South's current configuration is as temporary as temporary gets. Um, and it's there are going to be changes in the future because – I believe a school like Bryant does not long for the Big South. My prediction is the America East Conference will start a football league. And the America East Conference, which already has New Hampshire, Maine, um, as core members, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a few. Um, uh, no, Stony Brook is in the CAA now full time, but but New Hampshire, Maine, um, and then uh, th then you could bring in Rhode Island, which which plays in the CAA is that northern part. Basically, the northern part of the CAA would go into America East football. New Hampshire, Maine, Bryant are already core members of America East, so they slide right in there. Um, and 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 that's what happens. And I mean, I don't have any kind of um, direct knowledge of of conversations, but I have to assume that when Bryant was in conversations with the America East, when they were talking about potentially joining the America East, I'm sure that topic of forming a football league was broached. I'm sure Bryant probably said, hey, you become a lot more attractive to us if we know there are football plans in your future. So I, like I said, I don't have any kind of substantiated uh, evidence here, but I wouldn't be surprised if America East starts football because it just makes too much sense. Oh, and Albany. Albany is an America East member, uh, but plays CAA football. Albany used to play Northeast Conference football, but they left in 2012 uh, along with Monmouth. So NEC football was, uh, it was really going great. It was really on the up and up for a while. But now these recent membership defections have, uh, have really thrown the league a curveball. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's an interesting point too about uh about America East starting football conference. I know um uh, I've been been trying to work on a piece about uh, a new Yankee conference in uh in the year twenty twenty three, which uh, it could it could work with uh, the amount of of uh, football only programs just uh, scattered uh throughout the CAA and the NEC. So uh, that that is in the works. But I think I think the uh, I think America East starting football conference would kind of be a, sort of a um a take at that. Uh, which would be interesting interesting to see. So I'll be on the lookout for that for sure. Uh, something else I wanted to ask as well is in terms of Northeast 10 conference members, which has kind of been the, uh, I mean, for decades now, where the Northeast Conference has poached uh, its new membership. Are there any members right now that look uh, that you think would be attractive members 
for uh for the Northeast Conference. I know um, New Haven has tried to become a Division One school for years now, so maybe this is their opportunity. I know Southern New Hampshire uh can be sort of like a Grand Canyon or or a Liberty type member where they have um tons of online enrollment which means tons of viewership well I mean, maybe not tons but relative to the northeast conference tons of viewership in terms of having a a lot of online enrollment so any northeast 10 schools that really stick out to you um obviously you you you're, you're right to have your mind gravitate to the any 10 because stonehill came from the any 10 merrimack came from the any 10 uh bryant Bryant in 2009 came from the NE10. Um, so you're not wrong to look there, but I don't necessarily know who's left. Um, I've always heard rumors, and this was back when Bryant was making the move about Bentley. But my thing is that would have materialized by now, you know, over the last 15 years. And New Haven, I know they have been pretty aggressive in letting the NEC know that they uh, would love an invitation. But that's another thing, whereas if it were going to happen, I think it would have happened already. Now, maybe I get surprised and the NEC drops a news bomb in May that New Haven's coming in. Um but I don't. I, I I think it would have happened already. Um, I, I I think that um, it would have happened before Stonehill even happened. So uh, because New Haven was knocking on the NEC's door uh, well before the NEC extended an, an, an invitation to Stonehill. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where the NEC goes from here. I do think it's, uh, it's likely a division two. Um, there was some talk about a decade ago about, uh, Alderson Brodus, which is a division two school. Um, they have a football program. Uh, I, nothing ever happened there. And, uh, the other one that I'll keep my eye on, some people on Twitter, the Twitter experts kind of NEC Twitter for how uh, <laughs> big of a community that is. But uh, NEC Twitter seems to think that uh, Lemoyne College uh, could be coming in. And Lemoyne College is a Division II school in Syracuse, New York, or in, in central New York. And uh, they were taking advantage for a while. They were taking advantage of the, the NCAA bylaw that permits a Division II institution to play up in one sport for each gender. So you can be a Division II school and you can have a Division I baseball team and then a Division I women's lacrosse team, which is what, um, which is what Lemoyne had, uh, another school like Westchester in Pennsylvania, I believe, I don't know if it's still the case at one time they had division one wrestling and on the women's side, they had field hockey. Um, so Lemoyne, uh, they were, Division one baseball and division one women's lacrosse. And they were an associate member in the Mac, the Metro Atlantic athletic conference. And their women's lacrosse team was dominant and their baseball team was perennially a top three team. And to be quite frank, the max core membership got tired of letting Lemoyne win the conference's automatic bid. Um, and they were also complaining that they were at a disadvantage to Lemoyne because Lemoyne poured all their resources into just these two programs in Division I and funded everything else at a D2 level, whereas 
the Mac core members couldn't fund every, they had to fund everything at a division one level and they couldn't just concentrate all of the resources to, to two, to two, particular sports uh, uh uh baseball and 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 women's across and if and in the mac if you're going to concentrate your resources on any particular sport it's going to be basketball so basically the mac kind of got uh uh tired of of losing their automatic bid to lemoyne so they passed the bylaw that um, no longer uh, that prohibited uh, non-Division One associate members. So that's how they got rid of that because the MAC still has a number of associate members in men's lacrosse and uh, so on and so forth. But and this was around 2007, 2008. So from then, Lemoyne got dropped down from D1. So I'm sure there probably is interest in LeMoyne going back up. Uh, and, I mean, it is a trek up to uh, to central New York. Um, but if the NEC needs membership and LeMoyne wants to move, yeah, I, I think that, that that could be viable. I, I don't know if it's a hashtag done deal like people seem to think. Um but that would probably probably be the most likely Division II target for the NEC. The other thing is, I think the NEC really was targeting some MEAC schools, but no MEAC school wanted to be the school responsible for collapsing the MEAC. Because the MEAC, I think they got down to seven or six, six institutions. And if one more leaves, they're at five. Obviously, the SWAC took a lot of MEAC schools. If one more leaves, they're down to five. And there's no more AQ in your NCAA sports, uh, championship sports. So I think there may have been interest. There definitely was interest on the NEC side. And I think there was interest on some of the MEAC members from some of their from their side, but at the end of the day, I don't think they 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 really wanted to betray the MEAC and betray their colleagues in, in the MEAC. And maybe the word betray is a little strong, but um, essentially they would, you know, they it would not have, it would not have been good. Um, so with that said, the NEC has formed an alliance, I believe, and this happened after I I uh, left the conference, but um, the NEC did form an alliance, I know definitely in baseball, um, to play the MEAC school. So MEAC schools and NEC schools played a, a, a conference schedule together starting this season. And... Uh, Obviously, the NEC lost its men's lacrosse league when Bryant and Mount St. Mary's left, so they no longer sponsor men's lacrosse, but they were able to uh, to keep baseball uh, above that uh, number and help the MEAC by forming this alliance. Um, you know, I've also heard Howard. Howard is an NEC associate member in, I believe, six sports men swimming and diving, uh, women swimming and diving. Uh, I think there's a golf in there, uh, men's and women's soccer. But as far as Howard becoming a core member of the NEC, that would have, again, affected the MEAC. That would have basically crushed the MEAC. And I don't think that Howard had interest in doing that since – Really, Howard, you know, they're they're um, they are the MEAC. You know, their name is so. When you think MEAC, you think Howard. You know, they are a flagship member, and they've been for so long. And I just don't think they they wanted to be viewed as as the reason why 
an HBCU conference went by the wayside. Now, that's why Howard's not a core member of the NEC. But since then, I believe the CAA has had conversations with Howard. And I don't know where those conversations went, where they stand, or even if they're still ongoing. But if the if the CAA already welcomed Hampton into the fold, and they already welcomed North Carolina A and T into the fold, I think they would definitely welcome Howard into the club too, being that. Howard is arguably the most prestigious or most well-known HBCU institution in the country. I mean, the vice president went there. They have a lot of inf- uh, a lot of influential alumni. Um, so, I think Howard would fit into this the 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 the, the, the new CAA profile. So, if Howard were to go anywhere. I think it's to the CAA. So that puts them off the table for the NEC. So I think ideally the NEC probably would have loved to have a Howard and maybe a Delaware state, but uh, I, I, I don't, I, I just don't believe that's happening anymore. And um, yeah, so I, I guess if I had to make a prediction, I guess Lemoyne, but uh, the, the, uh, the the leadership at the NEC uh, could could very well surprise me. I mean they've they've surprised me before. Uh, that's why I no longer work there. But that's a topic for a different podcast. Um, so we'll see where where, where they go. But uh, they definitely have to be doing their homework right now and trying to find some um, some additional membership. Yeah, I agree. And the point of the HBCUs is interesting because I think um, it's hard unless there is a media deal that pays a lot more. Like I do believe the CAA's media deal pays more than the MEAC does, just given how much uh, how they're the flagship content on uh, Flow Sports. Uh, I guess why that's that's why uh, Hampton and um, NTA and T left uh, the Big South for the uh, the CAA. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to fight those uh, celebration bowl dollars, honestly. Like and uh, exposure from a national TV appearance on ABC on the opening Saturday bowl season. Like they a lot like the MIAC with only six football members have they have it a lot better money wise than I than a lot of um a lot of other um oh a lot of the FCS uh to be honest. So um on that point I I do think I do think it's going to be hard to lure, lure the uh, HBCUs it's got, it's got to be CAA or bus if um you're going to poach someone from the MIAC in my opinion um and then one one final question I have uh, it might seem minor in the scope of all this but with uh with St. Francis Brooklyn leaving the NEC does that affect the uh, TV deal with uh SNY the TV home of the New York Mets at all in your opinion um no, no, I, I still think the NEC would be able to um, air games on, on SNY. Um, from my understanding, SNY has been really um, good to work with uh, in terms of the local colleges. Uh, um, and obviously with the NEC having s- schools in that New York City market, um you know, they've, they've been work. It makes sense to have games on SNY, but even without St. Francis, Brooklyn, uh, the NEC still has two schools in New York city. Uh, Wagner college is on Staten Island and LIU has two campuses, but the basketball facility is in Brooklyn. So they still have two New York city schools, fairly Dickinson still in that SNY market and then Sacred Heart, which is in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, you know, n- n- not too deep in Connecticut, still really close to New York, where they get the the New York channels and the New York TV. Uh, they 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 would get the Yankees as opposed to the Red Sox uh, in 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 Fairfield. But uh, you know, uh, SNY has actually worked both with the conference office and directly with Sacred Heart to air some games, and then. SNY has also started working with Monmouth 
University down here at the Jersey Shore, where I live. Uh, Mammoth has had uh, football, basketball, and now some lacrosse games on SNY. Just had a lacrosse game on Saturday on SNY, but that will be the last one of the season, uh, as we know, because Mets opening day is uh, – is around the corner and you're not going to unseat the Mets on their own network. But uh, to give you the short answer, um, no, I think SNY is still more than willing to work with the NEC and they've shown a willingness to work with a lot of the local universities, a lot of the, the local D ones um, in order to get programming, live programming. And it really does make sense. I mean, I don't know why MSG, isn't doing the same thing. Um, you know, they, they, they rather air some kind of 1974 meatloaf concert from Madison square garden than, than put on a live game. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't understand it, but, uh, but we can get into that one in a, in a different episode. If you, if you've ever uh, uh, decided to have me back. Oh yeah. No, I'll absolutely have you back on Ralph. Um, definitely. You, you have a wealth of, a wealth of information on an overlooked conference, if we're being frank, uh, in the, in the NEC, but, uh, whatever happens, whatever dominoes fall, I'm excited to see what happens with the conference, you know, uh, both from a membership and a media perspective too. So, uh, I mean, uh, I'm excited. Um, yeah. And, and you, the, the one thing you just don't want to see, uh, schools cutting teams or cutting programs or, reducing opportunities you know that's the only thing you really you, you, you hate to see it um and my heart goes out to all the former and current St. Francis Brooklyn student athletes and the people that really gave their blood sweat and tears uh to that college uh, I know the athletics director Irma Garcia she was one time their women's basketball head coach she went to the school uh she basically dedicated her whole life to the Franciscans and to St. Francis college. And uh, it's gotta be incredible. The, uh, the, the pain those people are experiencing. So um, I hope we are talking about uh, realignment and moves and stuff like that in the future, but I just hope it's not because uh, a college decided to close up shop Um because that really helps no one, you know. Uh, and and uh, with that said, uh, with the Northeast Conference going through some tough times, um, that that hurts me for the players, the athletes, and for the coaches. Because there are, you know, whether or not they're top Division One athletes, or they're still putting the time in, they're still dedicating. They're still working hard. And, um, you know, they, they deserve the opportunity. And, and, and the coaches, really, the league is sort of underrated. You know, they're not putting people in the pros, of course. They're not a Big Ten league. You, you know, they we know that. But you'll find a gem every now and then in that league, uh, really world-class athlete every now and then. And – the coaches, for the most part, especially the football coaches, I mean, they're 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 world class. I mean, Jerry Schmidt at Duquesne, and mm -hmm. and Chris Valerio at at St. Francis, and Mark Nofre up at Sacred Heart. Three three gentlemen, three great football minds, three great teachers, three great leaders, and. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed my time working with them and working alongside them, and they they made it easy to promote Northeast Conference football. So, you know, I just wish the best for all of them, all the coaches and the players and everybody who, who puts their everything into it. You know, I just hope for a great outcome for them. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, uh, I think you put it best. Uh, that it's all about the student athletes and the coaches in the, in the end of the day. Uh, you know, we just, we just cover the things that happen with them. Uh, it's not, a, it's not about us. So I just wish them the best. And I just wish all the players 
all the athletes um, impacted by the St. Francis Brooklyn news just find new homes where they thrive uh, throughout the rest of their careers. Uh, and I think on that note, um, on, on a very hopefully uh, hopeful and triumphant note, I think it's a good spot to end. Ralph, thank you so much for uh, for taking your time to be on the podcast. I know it was late back east there uh, in Jersey, so I appreciate you staying uh, staying up late, 8.30 uh, El Paso time. Um, and look forward to having you again. And thanks for joining everyone that's made it this far. Hopefully you have uh, watching or listening. And until next time, everyone, peace, love, and soul.